What's going on guys, welcome back to the Trank. Today we're gonna to be taking this piece of maple ambrosia and turning it into an awesome, elegant miter box with splines. I'm really excited because box making is one of my favorite things about woodworking. And so stick around, I'll show you how to make this box. Okay, so I was initially drawn to this wood because of the long streaks that you get of what is actually the ambrosia fungus going in the tree, and um, I thought they'd be really cool to try and do a continuous grain box of some sort. So what I did is, because you need book match boards to do a completely continuous grain, is I found two uh, start and end point of the board that are similar as far as the grain pattern. That way, the fourth corner, which doesn't perfectly line up, would at least look somewhat continuous. So before cutting any of the pieces out for the box, I'm just getting a straight edge here with the plane. The maple is relatively soft, which it turns out the uh, ambrosia usually occurs in so uh, variants of soft maple, and so that makes sense. So it's pretty easy to work with with hand tools. I'm not going off any plans for this build, I'm just kind of going by eye, and I enjoy doing that sometimes. It's a nice break from following a, a plan um, to just kind of use your creativity and go on the fly. So after cutting out one of the sides and one of the end pieces, I then use the cat's mill as a stop block to perfectly set up for the corresponding opposite side and face. And I do this because in order to do the continuous grain, you have to cut side end, side end, or every other. Uh, so you can't just set up a stop block and cut both at once. I then bring them into thickness, clean up the face at the planer, and you, this is an essential part of good miters, is you need the thickness of all the pieces to be exactly the same, otherwise it's just not going to work out. Now of course that left a little bit of snipe, and so I do one or two passes on each piece with the hand plane just to get rid of that snipe. So here you can see some of the awesome characteristics of this wood. I made the uh, cut here and you can see it revealed all these little uh, ambrosia beetle tunnels, which was kind of crazy looking. And then additionally, you know, you get these little holes where they're actually burrowing in from the roots into the tree. And it's awesome to see when you plane it, how those characteristics just reflect down to this one thousandth of an inch piece of uh, feather from it. And it's just, it's just cool to see it all come together. So before working on the bottom for the box, I give a quick sharpen to the tools to make sure uh, they're as sharp as they can be. I actually just recently picked up one of these Shafton 16,000 grit uh, glass stones and the results are unbelievable and so I'll be excited in some of the future projects for you guys to see some action from that. So here I'm using this as the secondary wood, and I actually don't know what kind of wood this is. I had it laying around, uh, so I'll be interested if any of you know what it is to let me know. Uh, it, it was a relatively soft wood, and it kind of has the green of poplar, but I don't think it is poplar. So if any of you know, leave a comment. I'd be interested to hear what it is. But I flattened this piece and planed it down to a quarter of an inch for the bottom. So then I get the box parts and put in a corresponding quarter inch groove. I do this on the router table, which leaves a nice clean result and a nice clean uh, bottom as opposed to using a ripping blade on the table saw. You can also do it in one pass, which is a big advantage. So next I could start working on the mitered corners. Now I'm using the technique that Jason Bent shows in one of his videos on creeping up on the miter with the router table. And previously I've used the table saw to cut miters and I just tend to not get a very clean, crisp corner. Um, so I wanted to give this a try and uh, I'll already say right now that the results were much better than using a table saw. Essentially what you do is keep making incremental passes until you get to the exact width of the piece on the chamfer bit. And you want to make sure that you have a sacrificial piece or in this case just another piece of the box to avoid any tear out on the back side. So with the miters put on, I could then measure the inside, inside lengths plus the groove thickness in order to uh, measure the correct dimensions for the bottom. And I transfer these onto that piece. 
I then just cut that out on the crosscut sled. Now before assembling and gluing up, I want to do a nice sanding and finish of the internal parts because it'll be hard to get to later. I put some tape over the inside corners next to the miters because again, those will reveal a gap if there's any discrepancy in the thickness. So I just take careful care there when I'm doing that. After sanding to about 220, I apply some tongue oil and just do one coat on, on the inside surfaces. Okay, so then it was on to the glue up that I was kind of dreading doing because everything to this point was looking good and I didn't want to screw it up and get gaps in the miters. So I cut out these clamping calls and that way I'll be able to put a clamp directly on each corner and put pressure directly on the miters. The drawer bottom or the box bottom was a tight fit which really helped with alignment during this process. Now I'd like to say it went completely smoothly and all the clamps went on. But of course, I started having problems when some of the calls started slipping off because I didn't put quite enough CA glue on them. And so this led to a stressful glue up, which always seems to happen. And so I added some additional clamps on the calls themselves in order to keep them in place. There's a couple of them that ended up slipping. So while those were setting up and finishing, I could then get working on the splines. So again, I'm using that secondary wood that I used for the box bottom to cut some pieces off for both the top and for the spline material. And I'm using the trick that I just did a video on, on doing thin rips at the table saw to cut out some thin pieces of quarter inch stock for the splines. And this worked perfectly again with no burning. So I suggest you check out that video if you're struggling to make those cuts. I'm using this spline jig then to put quarter inch splines. I'm doing two on each face or two on each corner. And this worked out pretty well. Um, it was pretty smooth. I was, obviously it's scary cutting into a piece when you're this far into the project, but it turned out just fine. So then I take this spline material and flatten one of the edges. And then here's the crucial part, which is planing it into thickness. And so what I do is take off one or two uh, pieces at a time and then test them in the spline gap. And I basically dial in this fit to be just right so that when you add some glue, it'll still go in but have no gaps at all. I then use my pull saw on the uh, saw till here to cut those little pieces out for the spline. And cutting these out by hand is a lot easier than trying to cut these small, thin pieces out of table saw or some other method. So then I could work on gluing them in. You really don't need much glue here, and you can't put on much glue because it'll swell the wood and you will hardly get them in there. So it's a fine line between having them thin enough to go in and also having them thick enough to have no gaps. So it's, you got to just work with it. Uh, but most of them went in just fine. A few of them I had to do a little convincing with a mallet. But they all seated in the end and they were all in there with no gaps on either edge. I let those dry for a while and then came in with the flush trim saw to cut off the waste. Now in hindsight I wish I actually had put a piece of tape here to offset the saw a tiny bit because there were one or two spots where it just slightly dug in. Uh, so sanding took care of it but it could have been avoided. And here is one other thing I wish I had changed. Here I'm actually flattening the top of the box, but what I should have done is flattened the bottom first and then done the top. Um, because I, once I did the top, I didn't want to do the bottom because I didn't want to ding up the perfectly smooth and flat top. So you would actually do these in reverse if you were doing this again. But I just take these passes and go around each corner to make sure I'm not cutting across the grain. And after probably about 35 minutes of working on that, you can see the box top just fits perfectly flat on there and it's nice and smooth on the top ridge. Next I could work on fitting the lid and so I do this using my shooting board. Um, doing the shooting board method and allows you to just perfectly dial in the fit of the box. And again if anything is off square on the box itself you can compensate for that on the lid by just taking partial passes along one of the edges. And so it's a really good way to dial in the fit. You have to be a little careful when shooting these pieces that are longer than they are wide. You kind of have to keep pressure against the plane. Uh, but if you do this, you'll still get 
even passes and I just continue this process until the lid's perfectly fitted. So you can see here it's flush on all the edges and it's looking really great with crisp edges at this point. Okay, next I could start working on laying out for the hinges. I'm going to be using some Brusso hinges. I've had them laying around for a while, but I'm always nervous to actually use them because they're $40 hinges and you don't want to screw things up. So you want to be very precise with the layout here, and I'm going to be following Matt Eslia's technique on how to mortise and lay out these hinges by hand. And he has a really great tutorial on how to do this, and I've done lots of practice mortises in the past, and so I felt ready and confident to try it out on an actual project. It's really important here to use marking knife and gauges uh, in order to lay it out so that you get exact lines. And the first step here is to start chopping out and cutting up the fibers within the mortise slightly before you come in to pair them off. Now I do want to take just one second, guys, if you're looking for good audio protection and hearing protection in the shop, I really suggest you check out Isotunes Audio. I use them every day and I love them. And if you use the link I've got in the description, you can get 10% any, off any of their products. So be sure to check them out. So with those fibers split up slightly, you can come in and pair them up. Now you don't want to go right to the shoulder line or the baseline, whatever you want to call it. You want to just take off about half the material. And all the while, you want to be continuously watching the grain patterns uh, because it's so easy to accidentally cause a little split to come outside the marked area. And they'll, they'll immediately create really sore spots visually. So you just have to be super careful um, and just be very meticulous about it. However, cutting them out by hand once you know the technique and have practiced it is really enjoyable and it's, it's just, I actually felt more confident doing it by hand than I did by trying to get a router jig, which they do sell for those Brusso hinges. Um, I actually felt more confident trying to do it like this. And here's some more close up of just lifting those fibers up. And it's important that you're never just breaking off fibers. You always want to be actually shearing or slicing the fibers off. Uh, so they should just come out on their own like right there. You never want to force them out because again, those will lead to splits and it'll just ruin you in mortise. So after a bit of cleanup here, you can see I've got pretty perfect mortises here with the hinges sitting even and flush in there and I was really happy with how those were looking. And of course I cut corresponding mortises on the lid. Okay, so next I'm using a self-centering bit to drill some little pilot holes for the screws. And I probably would go back and just use the bit to actually self-center the starting point for the hole and then come in and drill them because those self-centering bits can be hard to control sometimes. It worked out okay in this instance, but I would probably do that differently. I then use the steel screw that's included to basically bore out the threads in the wood because the brass screws that you use are really prone to stripping. So you want to dip them in a little bit of paste wax or any kind of wax when you're installing them to make sure you don't strip them and make sure they go completely into the hinge. And then I could attach the lid to the box. You have to be a little careful here because obviously until it's screwed in there it keeps wanting to fall back. And then I could finally test the lid and I was super pleased to find that it was seating perfectly flush on all four pieces of the box and I was just really happy with how the fit was going. Okay so then I took off the hinges to do uh, final preparations and first I put a chamfer on the top side of the lid here. Uh, I thought it would kind of fit the geometric profile that was going with the underside of the box and so I just do that at the router table. Then it was on to final sanding before finishing, and I do this all by hand because, it, again, it's just easy to mess things up using a power sander at this point. And so I go up to 220 grit. There are also a few small dents in this softer lid, and so I used a wet or damp rag with a hot iron to just, uh, if you've ever seen this technique, it just is a really easy way to remedy those little dents in the wood. It just raises the grain and it pretty much makes them invisible. So. I could then start applying the tongue oil for the lid. Um, I wasn't super pleased with how the tongue oil ended up turning out. I think these rags were 
had a little more lint content in them than I needed them to have uh, because I ended up finding some in the residue of the finish. Uh, but I just applied this on by hand. I ended up doing three coats and applying the third coat with wet 600 grit, wet, wet dry sandpaper. So. And for the hinges, I gave them a quick polishing using a little bit of um, brass polish and some 10,000 grit polishing paper. And finally, I could do the final installation here, again, just using those little brass screws. And at this point, the holes were all ready to accept them and the alignment was the exact same as previously. Of course, at this point, I was a little bit nervous, like what if the alignment changed after the sanding and everything? Uh, but I just I reinstalled the hinges and put them back onto the box and luckily everything turned out the same with the lid fitting pretty much perfectly and I was just really happy with that because it's it's really easy to have the lid go on a little bit crooked or just slightly off so overall I was very happy. So that's going to do it for this build guys. I'm going to leave you here to take a look at some of the final shots of the box. Alright, that's going to do it for today's video. Uh, I'm super happy with how this turned out. I think that the wrapped grain around the box just looks super awesome and this maple ambrosia just has a lot of character to it. And probably I'm most happy with how well the lid fits. It just, it really comes down softly and it's flush across the all four sides of the box. So I'm really happy with it. So if you enjoyed this video guys, be sure you subscribe and check out my other videos. Thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next one.